Greetings, brothers and sisters and friends, in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Welcome to the Reform Campus Ministry. And this semester, we have been addressing the subject of a balanced life in the new normal. My task is to conclude that series by addressing the subject of death. Death being the event which we can say tilts the balance. It is also a challenge for us to understand whether we have any responsibility as far as tilting the balance is concerned. Now, I began last week uh, with the death of my mother and tonight I will begin with the passing away of my father which happened on January 10 of 2016 and he was a soldier and so he was given a burial at the Libingan ng mga bayani with full military honors. The arrows are pointing where I was during that ceremony. So as a soldier, military honors were given and rendered for my father's burial and I should say that it assuaged somewhat our grief and mourning. But let me tell you that when he was alive, my father was battling with colon cancer and it came to a point when he had to make a decision. When he was given the choice, he chose not to undergo further treatment for his medically hopeless condition. He was lucid until the last moment of his life and he knew what he was deciding and he knew that there was no hope. It was just prolonging the agony and he did not want his family to suffer unnecessarily. And so he made the choice of stopping the treatment which will not do any improvement anyway. And that is a true soldier's decision and for that I admire my father all the more. Now this is something that sometimes you and I may be pressed to make a decision concerning death and so that is our subject for tonight. Death decisions, should I tilt the balance? Let me just review and remind you of what we discussed last week when the balance finally tilts, that is when death happens without our own control or decision and when that happens, whatever the balance of life, it finally tilts at death. You may have your education, career, family and love life, church and ministries for believers, but when death happens, all those are gone. And we considered some biblical premises, two of this in the scriptures. The first is that death is the result of man's fall into sin. And second, death is decided by the sovereign purpose of God. Hebrews 9.27 is a good text to remember. It is appointed and it is God who is doing the appointment. It is appointed for men, for men to die once, but after this, the judgment. And then we considered in what way death is end of earthly life. And in three ways, there is an end that death uh, brings about. One is death ends the union between body and the immaterial component of man we call the soul or the spirit. Also, death ends all contact with earthly life. We addressed some of the superstitions that abound concerning the dying like ghosts and zombies. None of those because when death transpires, it ends all contact with earthly life as far as biblical teaching is concerned. But the most important end is that death ends all moral opportunity. There is no second chance after death. This is your opportunity to heed the call of God to repentance and faith and to have union with the Lord Jesus Christ. Because at death, Ecclesiastes 12, 7 says that then shall the dust return to the earth as it was, that's the body, and the spirit shall return unto God who gave it. That is in terms of accountability that we must uh, <clears throat> give to God. So my challenge last week was be prepared for eternity by faith in Jesus Christ before the balance tilts. So for tonight, we shall be addressing the question, should I tilt the balance? We are addressing here ethical issues that have to do with the decision to die. I intended originally to address issues of ethical concerns and particularly, I wanted to include euthanasia, which I'm sure some of you are facing now. 
but I feel that I would not give justice to my subject tonight if I just treat it briefly and then also treat euthanasia briefly. So I decided to focus on my subject tonight and defer the subject of euthanasia to some other time when the Lord wills and when the organizers of RCM may seem fit. So I'm just uh, pleading uh, with those of you who may be thinking of resorting to euthanasia, suspend it for a while until we can have a better time of discussing it. But for tonight, we shall be discussing a very serious issue, and that is suicide. Suicide is defined as the act of intentionally taking one's own life, whether it ends up fatal or non-fatal, it is called suicide. Now let me give you some pre-pandemic statistics on suicide. 800,000 die, that's close to 800,000 die of suicide every year. That's a big number. Uh, that's several people every day. And then for every fatal suicide, there are 20 attempts. So if we include the attempts as themselves suicidal acts, then not only the fatal ones, but the non-fatal ones would really multiply the number of suicide. And then in the U.S., suicide is number 10 of the top causes of death. So it is now part of the top 10 causes of death in a country that is supposed to be the most powerful, the richest, and the freest. And yet we see these grim statistical facts uh, in the U.S., Suicide is the second leading cause of death for the age group 15 to 29 years globally. Now, let me make the, I hope, a wise guess that I'm addressing most of you here within that age bracket and therefore this is very relevant to you. There are just so many things that press upon this age bracket and a suicidal thought is not uncommon for consideration. And then... 10% plus who make suicide gestures eventually commit suicide, which tell us that when you hear that, whether jocular or serious, it is a red flag and we must take it seriously. And one interesting statistic is that women attempt suicide five times more frequently than men, but twice as many suicidal men die. It is simply saying that while many women more women attempt suicide, more men die. And that shows that even in suicide, men seem to be more successful. But let me just observe here that suicide is an increasing worldwide uh, phenomenon and in all age groups. And this is all the more so in this pandemic. A significant rise is noted during the pandemic. And that is, of course, there is more depression people having to stay at home, people unable to do what they were able to do prior to the pandemic. And this is causing many to be more depressed than they would ordinarily be. And so there is a rise uh, of the phenomenon of suicide in our time. Now, let me say that in this present pandemic, uh, the, the suicide cases are due mostly to depression. And an episode of depression in layman's term is called feeling down. And so when it is prolonged, that is what amounts to depression. Now, there may be another professional language that may fit this, but for most of us, for you and me who are laymen, we just call it, I feel down. And what happens to many who are feeling down and are actually suicidal in their thought is they wear masks. And I'm not talking of the mask we wear to fend off the virus. I mean, they show one countenance to hide that which really is within. And they are uh, astute in using coded language in this matter. Let me give you two such coded expressions that have been used. There is this uh, uh, expression that in straightforward way reads, I'm fine, but invert that and it is actually saying, save me. So what seems to say nothing to worry about is actually a plea 
for rescue. Here is another. It, uh, straightforward. It reads, life is great. But again, invert it. And it is saying, I hate myself. And these are just examples. And there are others where a person may be saying something in a straightforward way. But within, they are hiding the real uh, depression and sadness that may, God forbid, lead them to a suicidal attempt. So let me begin with this assessment of uh, depression as a leading cause of suicide. Depression is a real experience and we are not dismissing it. There are those who think that Chris Christianity and Christians are dismissive of the idea of depression, not at all. It is a biblical reality that we see in the scriptures. For example, uh, we have the reality of emotional depression or physical. And we have that example in Psalm 102 with this title. This is part of the scripture of Psalm 102, a prayer of one afflicted when he is faint and pours out his complaint before the Lord. The word faint there, uh, you can put in its place the word depressed. A person is downcast and the whole sum. And there are many others which are psalms expressing the faintness of the psalmist. And therefore, it is a reality even for believers. And depression is an initial response to distress. There is an, there is an, uh, an event of distressful nature and that is beyond the control of the individual like this pandemic. Uh, the problem is the sufferer is unable to move on. It may be the death of a loved one and when the person is so affected by that distressful event and is unable to move on, especially when he has no biblical understanding of death which we studied last week, then that is very possible for that person to have an experience of prolonged depression and then it is compounded by irresponsible behavior and the most common irresponsible behavior in depression is procrastination you do not feel right and so you procrastinate what you are supposed to be doing as a matter of responsibility and it begins a vicious cycle uh, the person feels that uh, I, he is going to wait until he feels in, inspired and so he concludes now is not the right time and then he begins to think that uh, there may be another time waiting for the right time but time is running out and I'm in the wrong mood now and then I should wait until I feel better and then he goes back to the same vicious cycle of now is not the right time and when you have that vicious cycle guess what happens it accumulates the undone responsibility the undone work and it adds more to his depression what we can say of the depressed is that he is not helpless but he often refuses help he wallows in his distress. He wallows in his depression and self-pity. And so all the more, he becomes more depressed. Now, this kind of person will become liable to suicidal thoughts. So let me make it clear that our approach to the depressed and even to the suicidal is to radiate sympathy and counsel wisdom to the depressed. So I'm using there two key words. One is sympathy. Sympathy is the opposite of a contemptuous or scolding approach. That's not how we counsel the distressed, the depressed, and the suicidal. Uh, we see in Psalm 34 verse 18, the Lord's own disposition, which we need to emulate. The Lord is close to the brokenhearted and saves those who are crushed in spirit. Those are good graphic portrayal of a person in depression, crushed in spirit, broken hearted, and yet we are told that the close that the Lord is being close to such people and we need to show and emulate that closeness with people undergoing this experience. But 
not only are we sympathizing, where there are opportunities to do so, we counsel wisdom. And wisdom is insight. Insight into the reason, the cause, what's behind depression. And let me just give you some examples from scriptures without reading those scriptures. I hope you read them for yourself. One perhaps first case of depression we have in the scriptures is that of Cain. After his sacrifice was rejected by the Lord, we are told that his face went downcast and the Lord confronted him and the Lord exposed that this is because of sin. So here is one reason for depression uh, because of something sinful and when you do not face it in the right way, the more it will become a circular cycle of more sin and therefore more depression. The Lord's counsel to Cain is for him to rule over his desire. Now here is the first expression of what you would call mind over emotion. Much of depression is emotional and it is important that the mind overcome the trend tendency of emotion and we can do that and then another case in hebrews 10 24 is an address and ex exhortation to believers who are persecuted uh, the writer of hebrews counseling them that this is the time that they need the company of each other this is also the explanation and rational for the assembly of the church so that they can provoke one another to love and good works so the need for company or what we christians call fellowship and it has been observed that loneliness has been on the rise during this pandemic and loneliness exacerbates depression and that makes the person even more of a candidate for suicidal thinking and then you have some 10 17 that the lord hears the lord has an ear to the afflicted so one counsel we can give of wisdom is that of prayer to god there is a special ear god promised to the afflicted now you will note that in all this uh, wisdom from scriptures it is not giving a formula of solution and that in fact is not what we are after in the matter of depression remember depression is one's initial response to distress and we can do nothing about a distress that has already happened we cannot undo it and so we're not looking after solution as such in fact solution orientation often leads to failed formula programs so depressed people are given formula and steps uh, programs to follow that perhaps may help and assuage some externals of their depression but do not address the root of the matter which is in the heart so wisdom is necessary wisdom that comes from the word of god but let me now assess suicide in terms of its moral reality and that is it is evil the evil of suicide suicide is self-murder and therefore it falls under the sixth commandment which makes the prohibition very explicit you shall not murder in other translations you shall not kill but it actually uses the intensified form in hebrew and therefore murder is the right translation you shall not murder and that means uh, you shall you shall you shall not take the life of another person without just reason and in this case taking your own life without just reason is murder and therefore evil and this is usurping God's own sovereign purpose and right. Suicide is usurpation of God's jurisdiction over life issues. Deuteronomy 32 and verse 39 says, See now that I alone am He. There is no God but me. And so God is claiming here His uniqueness that there are no other true gods. Other gods of the nations are false gods. He alone is God. And one thing about his uniqueness as God is his jurisdiction in terms of life and death. I bring death and I give life. For anyone to take his own life by his own decision is 
usurping the jurisdiction of God over life issues. And when we look at the scriptures, all suicides in the Bible were of evil men. Uh, I'm not saying that it is not possible that a true believer may commit suicide. It is still a sin, but uh, in the Bible, all suicides uh, were of evil men. To take one example, in the Old Testament, Ahitophel, the advisor of Rehoboam, when his advice was not heard, he knew what was coming and so he committed suicide. In the New Testament, I don't need to even tell you because it is so familiar, Judas and we know why he committed suicide. These are not good examples of people who committed suicide. Behind every suicide is a self-centered solution to perceived problems. So we are now considering what those perceived problems are and how they resort to suicide as the solution to those problems. And there are three that we will consider. One is the problem of guilt and shame. And when you have to deal with guilt and shame, especially in a public scandal, uh, often suicide becomes the ultimate cover-up. Uh, it seems that you cannot face anyone, and so suicide is the ultimate cover-up. Public scandal can drive a person to seek escape, and if there is no real escape that he thinks is possible, then he may resort to suicide. This is Jeffrey Epstein, a person, a billionaire, who was exposed to have run a sex ring and has himself abused many women. And he was found dead in his prison uh, cell in 2019, uh, committed suicide. Now, I am aware of the investigation going on that it is possible some powerful men had him killed, uh, but there is there has been no uh, conclusive evidence to that effect. So, uh, if we can just consider this as an example of a man who had to face guilt and shame and committed suicide, he may think that this is the ultimate cover-up, the ultimate face-saving way that he will not have to face anyone except that uh, it is a cover-up but only to stand more exposed. And the reason why you stand more exposed is because you expose yourself to the judgment of God. And if you are looking for a real covering, the covering offered by the gospel is more sure and eternal. Now, did you know that covering is the same word in Hebrew for atonement. And that atonement is provided by the death of the Lord Jesus Christ. At least it covers our sins insofar as God's judgment is concerned. Romans 5, 9 says, Much more than being now justified, that is, acquitted by His blood, we shall be saved from wrath through Him. So this is the real covering of atonement, not that it skirts your sin away, but rather your sin is covered by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we can compare here the two people who were both guilty and ashamed of what they have done in, as disciples of Jesus Christ. There's Peter in his denial. He denied his Lord three times after boasting that he will not abandon him. And then you have, of course, Judas who betrayed him. What happened to both are a, a lesson as to how to deal with guilt and shame. Peter was restored by returning to the Lord Jesus Christ. Judas just could not live with himself and committed suicide by hanging himself. So this is guilt and shame that one may find that the only escape is suicide and I'm saying that it is not. Suicide does not cover accountability but as a matter of fact it hastens your accountability to face before God. So that's one uh, perceived problem that many use as to justify suicide. Another is fear and escape. This happens when a person feels that he is under unbearable uh, burden, there is fear, and he thinks that suicide is the ultimate getaway. 
who will not know uh, the sense of overwhelming burden and that may drive people to suicide and who will not know this face of evil Adolf Hitler who was murdered millions of Jews in his delusion of a so-called superior race but when he was being uh, when the allied forces were nearing his bunker and he was about to be caught he committed suicide on April 30 1945 and he gave instruction to his subordinate to have his body as well as that of his mistress Eva Brown to be burned and thus he did not need to face the judgment of men but uh, he may think that he has gotten away but only to face God's judgment and we must remember that there are greater values in life than earthly problems you may think that you are escaping earthly problems but there is the sin issue and the point is it is better to face those burdens in this present life with a solution that is in God through his grace in the Lord Jesus Christ rather than thinking of getting away thinking of escaping and mark 8 36 tells us what good is it for a man to gain the whole world now isn't that what hitler was wanting to do claim the whole world for his so-called and delusional aryan race and he conquered country after country but soon he had to face the reality that he lost and instead of facing the consequences he committed suicide but here you see is the real bad bargain of that uh, what does it profit to gain the whole world and yet forfeit his very soul and that's the point you have a soul that we studied last week that will face God in the judgment day so there is nothing wrong about being overwhelmed by burden in fact we have one psalm in the bible psalm 88 i call it the prayer of the overwhelmed because the this is the only psalm that speaks of affliction and burden after burden without any note of praise it is just one psalm every other psalm while expressing afflictions and burdens yet they can offer a note of praise psalm 88 is sometimes called the black sheep of the psalms because that is the one psalm that is full of uh, affliction and depression a downcast soul overwhelmed and yet guess what it is still part of the canon it is still part of the word of god in other words god intended for us to read something of this nature that a soul which is true a true follower of God yet can experience a prolonged consciousness of his uh, distress and depression so suicide does not escape judgment but it answers before God so it is not a getaway and finally there is the issue of pain and cure and if the person is hopeless of any cure and he has to be, deal with his pain then uh, he resorts to suicide suicide to many is the ultimate painkiller unbearable pain and suffering may drive a person to pain ending suicide you know he can no longer take it and so he commits suicide here is one of the saddest uh, cases of suicide that of my favorite comedian Robin Williams he shocked the world because he was one who seemed to be so full of laughter and certainly he made millions laugh at his antics and yet in 2014 he committed suicide hanging himself and there must have been some unbearable emotional pain despite the success despite the wealth despite the fame they were not enough to
repair the whatever pain that he had been carrying and he committed suicide so perhaps to people like him suicide is the ultimate pain killer if only there is no afterlife but you see there is as we saw last week and there is a purpose for pain that we may not understand immediately now when you think of pain and suffering who do you think of well in the old testament that would be job he has undergone suffering that most people would not likely experience death of his children and the very painful physical predicament he had to bear and yet through it all god has given him the grace to endure and later on in the new testament we are given this evaluation james 5 11, behold we count them happy or blessed which endure you have heard of the patience of job and have seen the end or the purpose of the lord that the lord is very pitiful and of tender mercy so instead of the pain being a an evidence of some cruelty on the part of god james concludes that God is showing his mercy, his pity, because of the experience of Job. Generations after generations have profited from the message of endurance through suffering by the story of Job. So we find that Job actually initially wished death. He was suicidal, but became a model for perseverance for all time because he waited upon God and when he had that face-to-face quote-unquote confrontation with God he then understood that God knows better and God knows better than we do and we should let him do what he is trying to weave through the suffering that we are undergoing and therefore suicide does not stop pain but it misses on God's good end There may be a purpose that you then miss because you try to make the solution yourself and a solution that is self-defeating. So what is common in all of this? The common denominator is in each case there is loss of hope and that in fact explains every suicide attempt when the person has lost any hope of solution any hope of remedy to his problem that will bring about suicidal thoughts anything can be endured if one could hold to some hope now one of the most creeping accounts i have read of one's experience is this by gracia barnum in the presence of my enemies you would remember perhaps gracia barnum along with her missionary husband Martin uh, Barnum were kidnapped and became hostages along with others by the terrorist group Abu Sayyaf and in a bungled rescue attempt Martin was killed but Gracia was rescued and she would later write this account of that experience in the presence of my enemies so this is the narrative of gracia barnum of their captivity by the abu sayyaf now one thing that i read in this account is how they managed to endure is they would think of a date a special date in the family let's say birthday of a child or wedding anniversary they would think of that date and they would try to imagine that by then they would be rescued and released and so they would hold on to that hope now if that date passes and nothing happens they would think of another date so in that way they manage to hold on to some hope no matter how that hope is just self-defined and therefore nothing guaranteed but you see hope has that enduring capacity they were hostages of the Abu Zayah for more than a year and uh, if not for that bungled attempt of rescue they would have been both alive but Gracia 
survive to give us this very good account of what hope can do. Now, one thing that we must be able to say in conclusion of this is that the gospel is without match in its message of hope in Christ. You can try to have hope in your wealth. Uh, you only need to think of Robin Williams, fame. You can think of power, think of Adolf Hitler, or your billions, think of Jeffrey Epstein. And all this shows that there is no hope in what man can accomplish. And that, in fact, is what the Bible tells us in Ephesians 2 verse 12. Remember that at the time you were separate from Christ, excluded from citizenship in Israel and foreigners to the covenants of the promise, so take note of this, without hope and without God in the world. So take the juxtaposition of these two expressions, without God, without hope. If you are without God, it's just certain that your future is hopeless. But against that, we have this message of Colossians 1.27, To them God has chosen to make known among the Gentiles the glorious riches of this mystery, which is Christ in you the hope of glory that is what christ is to us so when we think of anything that we feel is unbearable something painful this is the real answer to that if you only have hope for the future if not this future on earth certainly the future of eternity that hope is in the Lord Jesus Christ because of his death and resurrection. There is hope in the direst situation one can be under in this present life. So my challenge to you is submit to Christ as Lord of life and do not yield to the worst self-solution. So here we feel that we should not need to tilt the balance ourselves when it comes to the issue of suicide. Uh, God has jurisdiction over that and there is an answer to whatever we think is our guilt and shame and sin and suffering. The answer is the Lord Jesus Christ and that is the true balancing stand of life that reckons with eternity when you have Jesus Christ in your life. So I hope that you have considered this very seriously and you will know what it is to live a life that is truly balanced and a life that is truly balanced is that which has hope both in this life and in eternity in the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you for your attention. And may God bless you by the love of the Father, the grace of His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit.